Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sander Dolder. I'm a Senior Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, where I lead our work around thinking about what comes next, uh, and particularly with the green economy. So I'm really excited about this session for the next 30 minutes. We're gonna to talk to about workforce development. We're gonna talk about a great organization here in New York City and learn all about it and get inspired by it. So by way of introduction, I wanna introduce uh, us to Tonya Gale, who's the executive director at Green City Force. And next to her, there is Domingo Morales, who's an alumni of the group and also the founder of Compost Power. So to kick it off, I, I figured we'll get to know a little bit about what Green City Force is all about and uh, some of its programs that they run here in New York City. So, Tonya. Great, thanks, Sander. Um, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, I love talking about Green City Force. Um, so I'm happy to have the opportunity. Uh, so as Sander said, I'm Tanya Gale. I'm the executive director for Green City Force, and I've been with the organization for seven years. We were founded in 2009, and our focus is on powering uh, the green economy by lifting up the talent and potential of young adults who come from public housing communities across the five boroughs of New York City. So we're based in New York, we're citywide, we're heavily focused on what the acronym for public housing is, which is NYCHA, NYCHA. So NYCHA communities, including young adults who are 18 to 24 year olds, they come into our program through national service as AmeriCorps members, and we use that platform to train them, build their skills, help them understand about sustainability, not only so that they can impact their own lives and career directories, but so that they can impact transformation within the low income environmentally injustice plagued communities that they've come from. So we do this in a lot of different ways. Uh, Domingo's amazing um, model of like our vision of the ideal experience and talent and, and next steps. So I'll let him explain his own journey, but broad strokes, when folks come into our program, they're 18 to 24 years old. They are coming from public housing communities. They've completed high school. They have no viable next career path. And they may or may not have any understanding of the work they're about to undertake. Uh, they come into our spaces and impact change through a community with a 70 plus percent unemployment rate pre-COVID to uh, uh, a city within a city, uh, roughly 500,000 people across New York City. And the largest landlord with arguably one of the largest carbon footprints in New York City and decades of disinvestment. And so a lot of needs around um, uh, climate solutions in that sp space. So these young people are trained, they're building their skills and they're creating change within the other areas they're working on by getting other residents to behave differently. And Domingo can certainly speak to that as well, but we grow farms and we build opportunities for education, nutrition, food access, while also giving um, opportunity for folks to get not the first job, but the next job and career tracks and success, success as leaders in the green economy. So there's a lot of different ways we do that and we can speak more to that as, as, as the conversation goes on, but um, I just feel really um, humbled, honestly, and, and honored that I can be a leader in this space at a time where pre-COVID certainly, but absolutely now, environmental, economic, and racial justice need to be top of mind for everyone. And that's the work we've been doing for over a decade. So I'm really thrilled that we have this chance to talk more and uh, share, share what we do. Awesome, thanks, Tonya. Uh, I figure let's, let's give a little bit of an idea of what the program's all about and from the flow of the day to day. And Domingo, you have a great story mm -hmm. and I would love to hear a little bit about your experience, but also think about some of your ambitions and what you do now and sort of what came out of it is really fantastic. Yeah, um, so Green City Force is an amazing program. Um, I learned about Green City Force back in 2015 mm. and um, I had just quit a job at a restaurant and I was tired of working dead end jobs and I really thought I didn't have anywhere to go from there. I thought like, what am I supposed to do? What is my purpose? And I saw a flyer for Green City Force um, on an elevator going up to my building. This is when I was living in East Harlem. And the flyer had a picture of core members in uniform, just, <laughs> just like this one that you see here. And they looked like the army, like they looked like soldiers. And 
I'm like, all right, I, I have all of the qualifications. I have a diploma. I'm 18 to 24. I live in NYCHA. This is definitely for me. You know, I meet this qualification and not a lot of people meet those qualifications where I come from. You know, the high school diploma is a big one that's really hard to get in, you know, underserved communities because you want to make money as soon as you're old enough to work. Yeah. You're like, who cares about school and I need to pay bills and I need to eat. Um, so thankfully I had a diploma and I applied for Green City Force. And when I first applied, I just wanted to do energy work. I wanted to work on solar panels, maybe do energy audits. I wanted the program that was quick and the energy team was a six month program at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. um, but they wanted me the, for the farm team, which was an 11 month program. So um, I'm like, I don't want to be on the farm team. I want to do this training in six months and I want to go. I want to have a job. And um, I think it was Lawrence who was with us at the time, Lawrence Harris. He told me, no, looking at your resume, looking at all the skills you have, doing all those odd jobs, we need you for the long haul. <laughs> um, so he put me on the farm team and I'm on a farm and I'm doing farm work and I really wasn't sold on the farm work at first. I'm like, I'm not a farmer, you know? Um, I was more into technology, but I fell in love with it. I would go to a compost site three days a week um, at the largest compost site in the United States that didn't use fossil fuels, which was the Red Hook uh, compost site at the Red Hook farm. Three days a week, I was out there turning compost, which is you know food scraps that we take from residents and we turn it into this beautiful soil amendment but with a team, we would move 13, 14 tons of material in a single day. Mm -hmm. And that was just amazing to me. I'm like, we're moving mountains of material as a team. And this is reducing fossil fuels because we're reducing the amount of trucks it takes to bring this food scraps to landfill. Um, we're doing it in the most environmentally friendly way, which means we're also reducing methane because we're composting the right way by hand, making sure it's aerobic. <clears throat> but at the same time, I'm learning how to farm. I'm learning how to grow food in my house. I started growing lettuce in, um, out on my windowsill, and I started using the compost. And that really brought me to like the health of the soil, right? The, the soil biology, the um, fungal networks throughout our earth that you know, pass on information in the form of microbes and ions and nutrients. So I, I fell in love with this beautiful thing called you know, composting in New York City. And I applied for a job seven months into the Green City Force service term. I was supposed to be there for 11 months. Um, but my service leader, David Buckle at the time, he told me there's a job opening and you happen to know more about composting than anyone I know. <laughs> um, because when I leech on, when I latch on to something, I really go for it. Like I want to learn. Um, before I met David Buckle, I watched, you know, all of his YouTube videos yeah. to see how compost worked. Um, so I applied for the job with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I didn't think I was going to get it because you need a college degree and you needed a driver's license. I was born and raised in New York City, so I didn't have a driver's license. There was no need. Uh, we have public transportation, which can take you to all five boroughs. Um, and then on top of that, I, I never went to college. So I was hesitant to apply, but I applied anyway. And I applied, you know, because a few folks at Green City Forest told me, this is what this program is about. You know, coming into Green City Forest, you probably didn't qualify for that job at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, but now you do. After serving with these people, serving with your own you know, fellow residents in NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, teaching young adults, teaching adults, you have the experience that they're looking for. So I applied and I got the job. And the first thing I did um, was start to train other GCF core members, start to train other young adults that came through the program just like me. Um, and for the past five years, I was really just, just learning the craft, mastering my craft. Um, and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, every New York City compost project site was going crazy. Are we gonna survive? Are we gonna lose funding permanently? How are residents gonna reduce their food waste? Because we're just sending this to landfill now. Um, so a lot of our programs lost funding. I was laid off almost immediately after the shutdown. Um, and then after I was laid off, I, I faced a decision, like a really dark decision in my life where did the last five years of work that I put in, the last five years of blood, sweat, tears, late nights reading biology textbooks, did it go to waste because the program was just defunded? 
because it was funded by the city and the city lost funding. Um, and, you know, it took some soul searching, but I finally decided, no, it didn't. Five years, I was learning about compost. I was teaching other people. That's a college degree, you know? So instead of looking for a new job and resetting, I decided to start Compost Power. And Compost Power is really just uh, an idea that came to fruition thanks to Green City Force. I think of Green City Force as a tree, and I'm just one of those fruits that came out. <laughs> and Compost Power is one of the seeds of that fruit. Um, so for me, I just feel like Compost Power was my way to kind of push back and say, no, we can't stop composting in New York City. So I reached out to Tanya and I said, hey, Tanya, can I check out the Green City Forest compost sites? Because Green City Forest, they have farms on public land where we're growing food and we're growing that food for free for public housing residents. Um, but they also have waste. We have weeds that are growing. We have residents who, when they get the food scraps, the, when they get the food from us the following week, they'll bring us the food scraps. So every single farm has a composting site, but the composting site, because I'm sort of a perfectionist and I've, I've mastered this craft, I'm like, hey, Tanya, we can upgrade every single one of those composting sites. Please let me start to upgrade them. So I started that work. Uh, we started in Bayview. That was mm -hmm. the first Bayview, Brooklyn. Bayview Houses in Brooklyn was the first bin system I rebuilt as compost power. And I fell in love with it, started working, became a consultant with Green City Force, and I'm their compost specialist now. And then like a month into that work, I was waiting to hear back if I was gonna win this grant that I applied for, which is called the David Prize uh, Award. And it's modeled after the MacArthur Genius Award. Um, five people got a prize of five, uh, $200,000 each. Um, and my idea was to build compost sites and make it cool, make it sustainable, um, and make it so that it's ran by grassroots organizations. So the city can't say, hey, Domingo, we're pulling funding. You have to stop composting. So now, you know, I had no compost sites. Now we have five in uh, Green City Forest Farms, which is also New York City Housing Authority property. And then I have one on Williamsburg, which is on the waterfront. And the Williamsburg site is sort of my remix of what I learned at Red Hook, you know, a mid-scale composting site where you're not using any machines, you're doing everything by hand. So I'm able to train young adults on this site because we lost the Red Hook site and the funding for the Red Hook site. Um, so we started doing that work. And then a couple months ago, Tanya reached out to me and, and she told me, hey, Domingo, we have an opportunity to give you some staff. <laughs> and I love Tanya and everyone at Green City Forest because anytime they call you or call me, it's always some like amazing idea. It's a power move, a power play where we can expand the work that we're doing and build on the work that we're doing. So Tanya said, hey, Domingo, we have an opportunity for you to have 11 staffers. And, and I said, what? 11 staffers, is this part-time? And Tanya said, no, this is gonna be full-time, 11 staffers to do this work that you're doing throughout public housing. Um, so now that I have those 11 staffers and I made sure every single one of them was a GCF graduate. <laughs> so they came from where I came from. They had a similar background to me. They, they look and sound like me. We're a diverse mix of young adults um, and I feel like it feels good now. When I first started working in the compost world, it was really homogenous and there weren't a lot of people like me. And it was, I had to code switch a lot. And that's something, you know, you, you learn as a core member is depending on who you're talking to, you have to have a different way to go about your communication. So I feel like when I first started in composting, I really couldn't be myself fully. But now that I have a team of young adults and, you know, adults that came from the same background as me, I feel like we're just one family, just pushing this mission forward, expanding on this. We definitely want more farms to give more residents free food. We definitely want more composting sites. But the idea is to bring, you know, people to this site to give them that exposure to sustainability. I didn't care about sustainability at first, and now I love it. I love the fact that composting requires engineers, it requires landscapers, it requires plumbers, it, any trade and any craft you could think of when you're working with sustainability, it all comes together in one giant pizza, right? 
y y'all are farming green city for us i say y'all but it's, <laughs> it's all of us um <laughs> we're farming we're reducing food waste recycling those food scraps the most environmentally way possible we're doing energy audits in private housing with our empower work mm -hmm. um we've done work with solar panels green roofs mm -hmm. um cool roofs so like i just love how working with green city force when they exposed me to this, they exposed me to not only composting or farming, but they showed me that you can build a future if you just apply your mind to whatever you're interested in. Yeah. So um, I don't expect that every single one of my team members that I hired are gonna be professional compost managers in the future. I just hope that the soft skills we can give them, that data management, that volunteer management, they can bring that to whatever career they wanna go to and they'll have my support and they'll have the connections that they made with Green City Force, Compost Power, and mm -hmm. any organizations we work with. Um, that's that's yeah. really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of related, um, you know, the second half of this conversation, I kind of want to dive a little bit into um, what's ahead. Mm -hmm. But before we quickly get to that, mm -hmm. I, I was curious, you have 81% mm -hmm. graduation rate, 83% at least this is based on the yeah, website. Yeah, yeah, no, that's placement hard. rates after six months. <laughs> right. You know, how, how does that look like on the ground? Mm -hmm. What makes Green City Force really tick mm -hmm. at the community level where mm -hmm. you get that kind of participation, that kind of success? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really important question because we think about this all of the time. Um, part of what I appreciate about the model, which I can brag about because I didn't create the organization. So our co-founders <laughs> did. And I'm like, I think they did a really good job and I have now the honor to like taking it, take it forward, but it was a really good idea. So, you know, our frame is we're focused on young adults who are potential incredible talent that need a platform to thrive, who don't see that in front of them when they're, you know, 18 years old and may not see a next path that's viable. We're focused on issues that are around solutions to uh, climate and sustainability, and then we have a proven model on the ground, to your point. We have direct impact in public housing communities. We build and manage farms. On top of the farms, we layer the pieces of the work that Domingo's talking about, and we evolve these spaces into what we call eco-hubs, because the whole idea is we're trying to create systems change at the, at the sort of thought leadership level, globally and nationally and statewide and locally and within NYCHA communities. And so we're aspirational. We're about disruption and breaking systems of moving folks from, you know, rather than school to prison pipelines to alternative opportunities that may or may not include a traditional college path like Domingo, who is brilliant and had an access to exposure and has just been running with it, right? There's a whole population of over 50,000 people just in public housing between 18 and 24 year olds who could be, you know, future Domingos if they are motivated and, and enticed to want to consider it and get exposure. And that exposure is part of the power of why we're successful because they don't come to Green City Force because of me. They come to Green City Force because of Domingo. <laughs> and they tell their cousins and their parents tell their nephews and they see literally in community that we show up and we show out and we are intentional and proactive in place-based resident driven solutions. The people that are our AmeriCorps members are BIPOC young adults from frontline communities and they are the drivers of the change, which is a phenomenally powerful model, right? I mean, I'm just, I'm getting chills, right? <laughs> the, the, it works because when we're authentic in a space and we're um, naming the, the need and the power of the, the, the people in the space, then that's how the solutions happen. Right? And then when you get exposure and when you come in and you disagree because you don't have a full ex experience and then you get to experience, then you're driving your future and you're motivated. And if you feel the community and the support and the culture that is about supporting you to grow and not just checking a box that you've been trained and that's it, but actually being intentional about what is a job that's going to fit for you? What is a career track that's going to make sense? How do we position you to understand the training you need to be ready for that? Where are the soft skills that we want to help you um, be you know, improving on? We have support services, social worker resources. These are frontline community members with real historical barriers 
to success because of like all of the traditional you know, issues around crisis and poverty, they're very real. And we have a trauma-informed approach. Um, and we truly do believe that the talent and solutions come from the young people in the community. So we don't always get it right. Everyone's not a fit for us, but COVID's been really hard. Um, but part of the success is because we believe in the communities that we come from. We look for them to drive the change and inform how we move forward. And if we're doing our job right, then that's going to work because it's like a general education. It's like a foundation of exposure. It's kind of like the first two years of college if you go traditional, right? It's like you get your general education, eco-literacy, basic sustainability, culture of the organization, affirmation of young people as drivers of change, trauma-informed approach, youth development model. And then from there, it's like, here are all these different things you can consider. Here's solar, here's urban agriculture, here's a role as a second term of America. We have graduates who run their local community farms. They are the leaders. And because they come from that community, they're respected, they're valued, they, they, they're role models for other young people who wanna come and say, hey, what is that? Like, what are you doing in the uniforms, in the brand? What, <laughs> I, I, I wanna get paid, I wanna see what that's about. Come volunteer, come get food scraps, come to the Harvest Fest, right? And so this connection of this systemic, multi-stakeholder, driven from the community space, is how we approach the work. And I think that has been a, a, a very important part, part of the work, in addition to the fact that we have three pieces of program. The engine is the service core, national service. The whole point of that is to position people for career opportunities. And so job creation, workforce, partnership with employers, looking at investments that whether they're EV futures or urban ag futures or solar futures, how do we get in front of those partnerships so that we're ready and we know what our people need to be competitive and, and priority focused? Because not only because it's a check the box, because they're trained, they're from the local community and they are the best position to get those opportunities, right? And then we have a social enterprise that's about job creation because there's all kinds of investments coming into NYCHA for sustainability, ESCOs were getting contracts, multi-million dollar contracts for retrofits and energy efficiency. And while they're probably excellent at their work, if they're not from the community, they won't be successful if they can't engage properly with the groups they're trying to work on. So we consider ourselves uh, NYCHA's Civilian Climate Corps. <laughs> and we, uh, we work collaboratively across the city, as you know, with all kinds of other workforce partners. Uh, and we want our eco hubs, which now are five in five locations, potentially to reach the over 300 just public housing communities, let alone the work that's happening on Governor's Island and potentially Rikers in the future. We want ourselves to grow the number of eco hubs where public housing residents are driving solutions and getting jobs and getting safe and healthy spaces to live. Ideally modeling off the grid closed loop systems in our farm sites. We have you know, rainwater catchment infrastructure, solar on top of the food production and the, re and the composting and the recycling. And that's creating an awareness about what careers can even be. And so all of that is the, the vision of this holistic systemic approach to how we move forward. Um, and we've been doing it, thankfully, for a lot of different partners and stakeholders and you know, with the change in administrations across all levels of government now and the conversations around climate focus and civilian climate cores. We, we believe we're one of many proven models, but absolutely in New York City, a proven model of how disruption can be a platform of service, giving back, being part of solutions while you're building your workforce skills. That's what a civilian climate core should look like. And it should be not just the expert who's skilled, it should be the frontline trainer who has no exposure and steps and career paths along that and an intentional plan and a multi-year long-term plan to address how everyone can come to the space and be part of that solution with the right investments and the right attention and bringing in the thought leaders of all these different groups that we work with to, to drive the change and not start from scratch, right? Because that's just yeah. unnecessary and I think wrong. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, you know, just to expand a little bit on that since we're, we're, uh, we have about five minutes left, 
Um, you know, you, you brought up the point, well, first of all, systems change. I think right now we're at a time where federally things are changing. We're going to have a change of administration here in New York coming up. Um, the state is very involved in, in thinking about what comes next when it comes to renewable energy um, and other areas. And so there's, there's, there's this opportunity, this window to, to really do things a little differently. Um, when I look at the tax sector and the evolution of the tax sector here in New York, it wasn't necessarily as inclusive as it should have been. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's an opportunity now to really do that. And, and so you, you kind of highlighted at a high level sort of how your, the ambitions for the program and how you want that to expand. And I also think that there's lessons for rural communities mm. because there's, there's, it's not just in the cities. I feel like this is something that could be applicable everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but if you have, either of you, if you have some advice for folks who are in the municipality um, side of things in the government, whether local, state, or federal, like, how should they look at workforce development? And I think that, you know, we are starting in, in New York making some progress on that front and really mm -hmm. thinking about it, but mm -hmm. we have resources here. We have a team. Uh, a lot of communities just don't. You know, they, they, they're very limited in mm -hmm. terms of municipality. Mm -hmm. Like, do you have any sort of uh, suggestions or ideas there? I'll do like a minute and then let Domingo <laughs> go. So I should say, in addition to being local and NYCHA's Climate Corps, we are part of a national 130 plus group of conservation corps. And to your point, Every community has a, play, a priority of focus, whether they're rural, urban, uh, coastal, what have you, and the priorities of solution, whether it's climate or other needs, should be informed by the needs of that community. So I'll just start with that. And so elected, to your point, and government officials need to like tap the knowledge of whatever community you're in to understand the priority needs, right? Because we can make up a list, I have nothing to do with this area and I just go off the top of my head, but like the people who live there know what is needed, right? So like that's basic, but it's like, should be say, it's said, right? It should be like, what do the people actually need as a priority? Um, and then uh, it's all the things I was saying before, but I'll, I'll give it to Domingo, but I think people know, need to know who knows what's going on already when they step into those roles. <laughs> Yeah, I would say, you know, we can't use the top down approach. We definitely and it's no uniform picture. You know, every community is going to need something different depending on where they are, the you know, how much money that community makes tax brackets. Um, every community is going to be different. But I think just like Tanya says, going down, getting some boots on the ground and actually talking to the community, um, even if it's a community that you don't think needs help or it's a community that you know, people are kind of uncomfortable going into. If you're uncomfortable going into a neighborhood, then you're not the person that should be going into that neighborhood. The people who live there should. <laughs> um, so maybe just creating job opportunities for people who live in that community to do some of that recon work for us, where they're going out and organizing people since they are a staple of that community. Um, you know, as simple as a barber, everybody goes to the barber, you know, so speaking to that barber and asking him, hey, what's, what's the issues in this community? What kind of jobs are y'all looking for? Just speaking to people and not using that top-down approach, because that's what we do a lot. And it, it ends up being, you know, programs that are dictated to communities versus communities choosing. So one way we keep the residents engaged at the NYCHA farms is every fall, and spring, we're sending out surveys to see what residents want us to grow. Um, so things as simple as that, if you are thinking of putting something in an area or a community, um, just make sure it's what they want and make sure you know, you're thinking about the health of everyone when you do it. Yeah. It's really about building networks and really making sure that there's a translation because oftentimes top down, they, they, <laughs> it avoids that and bottom up, sometimes it'd be hard to sort of translate. So you kind of have to have mm -hmm. this vast network to sort of mm -hmm. bring things together. Yeah. One other thing I just add yep. briefly is that just practically there needs to be a multiple year long, short, mid and longer term plan, right? Because if your plan stops after six months, 
you know, the plan is done, right? If, you, if you're right. building a real plan, it's got to be intentional and it's got to be aspirational and it's got to be long term with investments that show a path to it being able to stay long term. And that's really important, especially government funding. We have models at the state level. NYSERDA is historically really strong in understanding a pathway and a multi-year plan in working with partners and workforce particularly. Um, and I think all investments at a policy level need to be thinking that way. Yeah, that's a great point to end on. Yes. I want to thank Domingo and Tonya for joining us today. And uh, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. All right. Awesome.